Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed participants and distinguished guests. Welcome to the training session of the second virtual international negotiation competition organized by Mediate Guru in collaboration with Newcastle University and Jargon Lake University. I'm your moderator for this training round and it is my pleasure to guide you through this exciting event. Before we begin, let me introduce our expert trainer for this session, Ina Petkova. Ina brings a wealth of experience to the table, having a diverse background in law, mediation and negotiation. After graduating in law and passing the bar exam, Ina realised her true passion lay in mediation and negotiation. She has worked as a legal advisor, assisting international clients in Italian English and as a certified mediator. Ina has been actively involved in the competition circuit, coaching the team from Sofia University, her coaching experience led her team to an impressive fifth place in the fifth IBA, VIC, CDRC and 16th ICC mediation competition. In addition, Ina has served as an expert assessor in various prestigious competitions, including the IBA, VIAC, CDRC, the, Transla the Transatlantic Negotiation Competition, the APIIT Law School International Negotiation Competition and the Online Dispute Resolution Competition. Ina, we are delighted to have you here today. Without any further ado, let us begin with the training session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Gracie. And, you know, thank you for inviting me. I'm really, really happy to be here. And it's, I think it's an wonderful opportunity to do that before the uh, before the preliminary rounds um you know as grace said my name is ina and i can only hope i can live up to this introduction um you know when i discussed with garima what i wanted to talk about i told her that i'm going to speak about broader topics and not just uh, ticks and trips you know that um can help them, but I hope that doesn't disappoint the participants. But I also made sure that I have some uh, specifics to share with them uh, right at the end. Because when, for example, when I've been a coach, uh, and maybe that translates okay. after um, being an expert assessor, when I give a feedback, I try to be really specific because I know. I know it's the things, the really small things um, that are really particular that are going to stay with the participants because after all, it's really nerve wracking and it's really um, nervous being in a session. So right after that, the feedback, I really try to be specific because on the next session that can be in the very same day or next day, they really not need that. Um, phrase that I catch that maybe didn't translate as much on the table or some specific thing that they did and maybe didn't play out as, as much. But still, um, you know, today I wanted to talk about something that's really broader. Um, and why I wanted to talk about it is in a way to give the participants the opportunity to use today um, so that they can step back from all the um, everything they've prepared um, and see why I think for me personally, negotiation and mediation are really, really um, important as processes. And what I envisioned um, in talking about was simply talking because we can in those processes and you know mistakes in progress, and what I would add to that and where I'm going to start is communication skills. Um, you know, I'm more and more happy and grateful that so many competitions are taking place all around the world. Maybe in, back in uh, 2016, as far as I knew, um, I knew the competition in Paris, the ICC competition. I knew the competition in Vienna, the CDRC. Um, in the Lex Infinitum in India, but nowadays we can see, I don't know, maybe it's not every month, but still um, every three months there is another competition somewhere else. And that makes me happy because 
I can see, um, you know, these are the scenes where you can, in a way, embody a character and play out scenarios through communication. And I came to realize um, through the years how vital these competitions are because, okay. yep. Is there something that's wrong with your audio? No, ma'am, it is perfect. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so I think they're vital because it's through the acknowledgement and the obtaining of those different communication skills, such as you know, active listening and open and close questions and empathy. Um, in their practice mainly that we manage quite everything in our life if we think if we think about it and you know training in preparing for a competition and playing out during the competition in uh, the different stages we come to understand what is it that we are good at and very importantly what is it that we are not good at maybe we're not as good in questioning or, and I mean it in the best way, you know, it's not like an investigation, but are we good in active listening? Are we good in showing empathy? And, you know, my touch with mediation was back in my first touch, probably. Um, it was in 2016, right at the end. And then in 2017, I was a negotiator for the Sofia University team. And I mean, through all those months after that, and in the years, I, in a way, became so much more aware of the people around me, be it colleagues in work or, you know, friends, family. Um, and I kind of saw how much is it that we miss and lack in communication skills? And, you know, I am really interested in knowing and I'm going to ask you a question. You can answer that in the chat box and maybe we can wait for a minute or so uh, if somebody wants to answer that. But is it the same with you? Was it like since being trained in mediation or negotiation and having acquired, acquiring those skills in paraphrasing and in questioning, um, have, you, have you started noticing and being more aware of um, in your groups, you know, in, in families and peers and friends, how people really struggle to communicate and, or, or maybe people adopt, um, a communication way that is not really benefiting. So I'm really curious to, to understand if you have started noticing that around you now that you have those skills. And I'll, I'll, I'll give just a minute to somebody if somebody wants to answer that. Um, and, you know, have we, have we really... Can we really, Can we really talk talk about, about, sorry, um, why is this happening? Let's see if somebody's going to answer. But even if you don't, don't really don't worry. As I just want to make a point here and I hope um, it's the same for you. Okay, maybe no one's going to answer. I'm not heard. Uh, but, ah, see, there's someone that's going to save me. People definitely struggle to listen and understand. I'm sorry, I'm just tilting my head so I can read. Definitely struggle to listen and understand other person's perspective. I think problem lies with knowing the difference between listening and hearing. Okay. That is 
flagship, I think. I hope I read that correctly. Let's see if somebody else is going to put, them, put themselves out there. No, I, I'm asking that because I try to, you know, think about why, why is it really um, purely deeply? Why is it that we struggle so much? Because sometimes it's people that, you know, you have really um, in fire regard or that are really kind of successful. So you are really not sure why is it that um, they adopt such skills that probably are not as benefiting as they could be. Let's see, most people tend to react. Mm, tend to, to react instead of respond, true. We chose a gap between what was said and what was understood. Or my classic is when I ask a question um, day to day and I can see the answer is totally different from my question. I, I still sometimes can't understand how can the question be so straightforward and the answer can be something completely different. There's another answer, empathy to understand. True, that's from Teresa and the previous one, the previous one I can see only 40 as a number. I don't have a number, sorry. Okay, so, you know, I, I said, I try to really think about um, why is it that it happens like, like that. Um, and for some time now, and for different reasons, actually, um, it did confirm to me on uh, so many levels that we have to go back to psychology and neuroscience because they have a lot to do with communication skills. And in our case, and we should be interested in how is it that they play out in negotiation and mediation. And what I mean is that if you think about it, as far as we know, we can't choose um, the family we are born in. We can't choose the family we are going to be raised in. And it's, it's the very place, our early childhood and those people that are giving us our basic and first uh, set of communication skills. And we can only hope that, you know, they are good communicators and they have good skills and they can actually convey that to, the, to us and teach us. Um, and that they can imprint that on us. But as we know, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure it's for you as well. Um, very often than not, it's not the case. And we, I mean, it's, it's nobody to blame um, because be it, you know, they, they are trying to do that for us, but we can only re rely on that. And when it's not happening, um, it can be as to their upbringing, it can be the generation they are born in, it can be the culture of the country, etc. They're in, um, there are places we can choose where we can expand on those communication skills. And this is why I think competitions such as this one and all the others are vital because these are the very, very places where you can broaden and expose your way of communication and see for yourself um, where, where is it that you're lacking and how can you, you know, work on that? And I think it's, it's, it's extremely important um, especially now, because we now know, you know, from surveys that there are certain patterns, as I, as I said in early childhood, that we adopt so, so many patterns that can be actually limiting, you know, and they can kind of put us in a tunnel 
And if we only use that tool, we won't have something else in our box that we can reach out and try in, in another situation because that very pattern that can be limiting at some point in a situation, it, it could have worked for us, but it's not for every situation and it shouldn't be. And as I, as I go back to the topic of psychology and neuroscience, um, something that really, you know, strike me so many times is, um, it's a pattern called ANTS. So it's a A N T as the, as well as the um, ants that can crawl on you. And they're very well um, written and explained by Dr. Daniel Amen. I think it's, he's a psychiatrist. But two of those ants, I think there are nine types. Two of those um, ants, I think we can really well see play out in negotiation and mediation. And one of them is mind trading or assuming. And he explains it as when you think that you know what somebody else is thinking, even though they have not told you and you have not asked them. And the other, the other aunt is fortune telling, you know, uh, trying to predict what is going to happen in the future. And, you know, I'm sharing that because I guess I'm trying to leave you with the understanding that it's it's much more that is playing out in a session than just making sure you know the right time to present first offer or what are the exact questions that you have to ask. It's It's so much more because each and every one of us has their has their set of skills. Some of them are limiting. Some of them are not really helping. And you know, try and try and not assume when someone else is talking um, that you know what is it that he's saying or she's saying and why he or she is saying something. Because um, it can be very well that this aunt of um, mind reading is crawling on you. And you can admit that, you know, you can, you can say, you know, I can feel that I am assuming what you're going to say or why you're saying something. You can very well tell them, I don't want to assume I want to understand and I want to understand if what I'm thinking is true and it's right. Can you, can you help me? Can you, can you help me understand you? Can you share more information with me? Because honestly, I don't want to assume and it's something that everyone does. And when I'm speaking about those ants, they are with everyone. I mean, it's all those nine types can be within you the most important thing is to recognize them, catch them in a way, and debunk them. And we can do that only through admitting, for example, with understanding, uh, trying to understand and asking questions. Because after all, no one, you know, no one wants and no one knows what's in someone's um, head. And thank God for that. And I, when I say admitting, I'm, you know, circling back to what I said at the beginning. I still have some specific things that I wanted to leave you with, with as tips and, and tricks for the sessions tomorrow. And one of them is admitting mistakes. Because, you know, during the competition, Everyone is nervous, so it's it's really um, it's really not hard to make a, a mistake. So my advice to you will be to admit that and to be vocal about it, saying that you are making a mistake during during this making of a mistake. 
Um, what exam? I mean, an example I can give you is when we are talking about different roles and counsel and counsel and client. And I mean, we know during training, um, we know there are topics that the counsel can or cannot speak about. And one of the one of it's not a rigid rule, but still, it's something that to to be aware of. And the council, for example, it's, you know, it's not good that he talks about, he or she talks about money, money issues or prices or business related um, decisions that have to be made by the client and not by the council because he's there to support the client. But sometimes in the, in the discussion, the other party can say something and the council can be really quick and jump right in answering something that it's, it's really business related. But by, by doing that, it's, you know, you can say, I, I know it's not my, it's not my place to say if the price is right or is if the, and the offer is um, as tempting, whatever it be. I know, I know it's not my place to say. I just wanted to make sure that my client knows that I have some, Some thoughts on it, um, and you can you can do that right, right at doing that mistake. And what this um, makes in a competition, for example, is making sure that the judges know you know that you're making a mistake, but you were really quick to realize, and you know what you're doing. It wasn't your place. But you can say that and you can share that to the other party. You're not scared in um, sharing that with them. And as far as the other party goes, I think it, I think it kind of creates a more human face for you if, if, you, if you want to call it like that. Um, in a way, it shows the other party you can make mistakes also. You know, it's not, it's not the end of the world. We call them mistakes that they're not really mistakes because they give you, yeah, different type of information, but still with some information and signals. Um, because you can share something that maybe wasn't the right place or you shouldn't have um, shared at all. But still, this will give you a signal from the other party. Where is that there at their place at the time? on this topic, on this information, and it will also help you. And a second thing that's that specific uh, tip is to make sure that you have some time and you take that time and you take a piece of paper and write down um, several things. And it's something we uh, did with, with my teams. Uh, one of them is that you have to write down your goals. And by goals, I mean, what is it specifically that you want to achieve in a session? And why do you want to achieve it? What are the, what are the drives and the needs and the interests um, that, want, that make you want that and make you request for that or demand for that? I hope you don't demand for that, but... Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's one of the most important things to actually know what is it that you want there? Why are you on the table today? Um, another thing that you, I think you should put on that list of paper is, you know, try and prepare answers to questions that are really not comfortable for you or the so-called weak, weak points because in every case, we have them. And it's, it's really important that you know how to respond to that, not only to save face, not only because um, it really changes when you're not prepared with the answer, but again, also for yourself so that you can um, clarify for yourself, what is it that we did wrong? Uh, how is it that we made that or how is it that we can um, 
make something that's alternative to that in the future? How is it that we don't go there um, another time? So again, it gives you clarity on an issue that, yeah, it's a weak point for you, but again, it helps you be the other party for a second and see from their point of view, what is it that, it, that is bothering, bothering them? And what is it that they want to know <clears throat> about this mistake that you made, for example? <clears throat> Sorry. Another thing I think it's really important and it may very well not be the case that you have to make an apology, but when you have to do an apology, it has to be genuine. It has to be sincere. And it has to be genuine because if it's not, it's, it's not going to play out good. Not only that, it's, it's really going to hang in there, uh, probably even create more mistrust and more problems for you. And I think, you know, taking the time again to understand where is it that we did something wrong, it will give you, again, a clarity and the genuine, genuine understanding of why is it that you're apologizing, what is it that you're apologizing for? And it's important because it, it, it's going to give you integrity. Um, and it's one of the best things that you can show to another party, it's integrity. So probably the last thing uh, I would put on that list is what is it that you don't want to forget in the session? So things that you don't want to forget, be it details of, uh, details of the case, prices, um, you know, all those details that are pretty much um, the corner store, um, store and show how much you know the case. Um, questions, probably questions that you have thought about uh, and you don't want to forget and you should ask them. And then I would say the third specific, so that's on that, that's on that piece of paper. Of course, you can put um, the names of the other parties, you can put whatever it's going to help you, you know, being really close proximity to your vision. Um, the third thing about those specific th uh, tips that I wrote down for, for you is don't lie. Um, you know, you can say that you don't feel comfortable sharing this information at that point of the discussion or that you're not ready to share it or that you can't share it at all, but don't lie. Because um, what is it that you're trying here? The resolving a dispute is to create trust. And by lying or by not being genuine in your apology is going to shake that trust even more. The fourth thing uh, I think is very important is to mirror and match the energy of the other party. And this can play out in a lot of ways. It can be verbal, it can be nonverbal. For example, what I've seen, for example, is to two teams that are competing and one of them is asking many, many questions and the other one is just answering them. And it's not giving back, it's not asking back a question. And you can just feel the, you know, you can feel the discussion going so unbalanced and so unsettling that, for example, as an as a expert assessor, you kind of want to jump in and ask, ask or turn back a question to the other, to the other side. Um, and you can play that out firstly by noticing that um, you have to mirror and match and you have to start asking questions. You can even do that by, in a way, sharing their mistake and saying, you know, 
there are so many questions and I'll write them down and I'll try to answer all of your questions. Um, but let me just let me just park them for a second and let me ask you a question. And as I said, it can be um, it can be in a nonverbal way. Some of participants can be um, with an intonation that's very different from yours. Again, you have to notice that and you kind of have to mirror and match them so that the energy of the session is not um, is not in not interrupted, but what would you say? Um, it, it will be really hard to follow and it would be really hard not to not to notice that if you are someone outside of the session, be it a judge or observer or the coach or, or whoever it is. The fifth thing, um, I think it's, I mean, it's really, really helpful, helpful for you is to visualize. Um, to make things really visible because this competition, for example, is online. So you have to use the, you, the options you have to share your screen or to share a um, whiteboard, put on some table with, if you have some specific details, prices, calculations, it will not only give clarity to you when you're preparing, it will convey that to the other party and it will make sure that you understand each other. Because sometimes the language can do as much. And after that, we have to use the other tools we have in the box. And one of them is to make things visible. You can use that if you have certain timeline with a lot of deadlines, for example. Um, and it's really such a beautiful thing when you see that in a contract nowadays, because it, it sometimes it, real graphics can tell you so much and make things so much more clearer than a clause for a con in a contract, you know, especially for business people. The sixth thing, and I, it's not the last, I, I have one more, but the sixth thing is um, in regards to the online competitions, such as this one, and you know, there are certain things, for example, lights. Um, I have seen many, many participants that can be in a room that's really, you know, it's, it's really dark. So you can't really see their face when they're speaking. And it's okay, it's the judges, you know, you can work with that. But for the other party, I think it, it's not very helpful for them. It's not very helpful for you, that for sure, in in a, in a way to communicate with them. Position, if you if you'd like, um, make sure that you put your phone or your uh, your laptop, computer, whatever you're using, somewhere where you can fully see um, your face and probably be at a position that. It's not really talking down on someone like this or uh, talking or being talked down, you know, if you are uh, well under the screen. And maybe this seems pretty straightforward, but I have seen that many times and I know, I know how it played out. And it, it's something that we always say as judges. The seventh thing and the last thing I wanted to share with you as a specific tip, and it's, you know, it, it's for a time after the session. It doesn't have to be right after, but make sure that you make time with your teammate, with your coach. Again, on a piece of paper, write down, firstly, what is it that went right in the session for us? Then secondly, what is it that didn't go so well for us in the session? And thirdly, and very importantly, what could have gone better and how? How is it we can now see that certain things could have gone better? We can write 
I mean, we can see them right there on the second topic, what did not go so well for us. Try and think of the alternative phrase or action that you could have adopted at the moment, because it, it will broaden your way of seeing alternatives to situations, to issues, to matters, and to dispute and, disputes and cases. And it's one of the more, more so rewarding thing, such as, you know, taking part in these competitions. And, you know, I hope with that, I, I try to understand, I try to make sure that you understand how vital is it. And I truly admire you for, for making time and doing all those preparations and be part of such competitions because it's it's hard it's really hard but still it's something that's going to equip you with so many things and it's far far better to understand and acquire communication skills during those sessions because it's 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 a play right so the consequences cannot be as um hard for you but then if you don't do that and you go back into the real world, um, if you don't have those communication skills, you will see that it will be very, very hard on you. Um, so again, heads off for making the time and taking part in the competition. And I, I truly hope that some of the things that I said make sense for you and that can help you. And with that, I'm ready for the questions. If there are some, if there are not questions, I mean, I just, I will just think that I left you amazed. Are there any questions, Garima? Yes, ma'am. We do have questions. Just a second. Okay. Should I should I read them out loud or is someone someone else going to read them? Mom, we are just waiting for Grace. She might have some technical issues. Uh, I oh, just I wrote a question from the chat box itself. Uh, what level of legal knowledge are we supposed to share during the negotiation sessions? Well. It really depends on the case and it really depends on uh, competition. But I would say most of the negotiation and mediation competitions really are trying to refocus from the truly legal aspect of a case. So I would say if you're a counsel, for example, it's of course, it's really well to prepare yourself because it, it will give you the foundation and um, in a way that you can you can answer right away uh, when, for example, the other council is asking you something strictly legal. But I, I don't think it's, it's something that you have to dwell on so much. And again, when admitting um, things or exposing, if you would like, um, the, other, the other team, you can right away say, you know, we can dwell in that. I'm, you can you can show as a council I am well prepared and I can do that. But that the process that we have here, that's negotiation. It's we can use that um, so much more and in such a better way than just sharing and dwelling on legal topics and things and clauses and. Stuff like that. I hope I understood the question correctly. Yes, ma'am. Sorry about before my um, camera wasn't working, but I'll read the next question from Henry, which says, what, what should be our strategy when the other party plays the bully, being uncooperative uncoop with our offers and just stating the same problems repeatedly? And saying? And the last Left it and just stay in the same problems repeatedly. Mm. Well, 
again, I will just go back to exposing them and saying, saying this very thing that you actually ask, you know, probably not in the same words, not saying you're kind of a bully, but just trying to, trying to make sure that you vocalize what you feel um, that they're doing and saying, you know, um, we are really not comfortable with you, um, I don't know, trying to stall the, se the session and trying to bullying us into saying yes to something that it truly wouldn't work because we actually haven't had the opportunity to explore what can work for us. And repeating over and over again um, a problem won't, won't leave us, uh, won't um, get us really far. And maybe ask them even, how do you feel if we park this for a second, even take a break, um, talk to the, if they want, um, talk, if you have a mediator, talk to the mediator. And then we can come back and see if we can resolve that or if we can move on to another topic that can, you know, shift the focus and maybe give us more clarity on the thing that actually is stuck there and we are stuck in it because of you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Ina. The next one is seeking accepted clarifications. It may look like we are dwelling on the past. How can oh. we make sure that we ask for clarifications from the opposing party without poking the past? Yeah. Well, by saying that, you know, um, we are sorry that we keep on asking um, we keep on asking about a certain thing. It's not because we ha we want to dwell in the past. It may very well look that for you, and this is why we are saying it's not. It's not that thing. It it's just that we feel like there's something more there. Can you say right away? Is there something more there, or or, or is it that we just we are just assuming, you know, there's the ant again of mind reading or fortune telling. Um, and if they say, you know, that there's nothing more I can tell you, you can, you can just go back and say, thank you. Uh, we really needed that um, confirmation for you. And, you know, that's okay with us. We can move on. Because sometimes there is something more, you know, and if you feel that, if you feel that you have asked too many times about it, say that you have felt that. Say that for the judges, say that for the other party, make them, make them understand that um, it's not because you want to dwell from the past, it's because you want to understand. It's because you're lacking some kind of information that is going to help you help you make make up your mind about something. Brilliant, thank you. The next one that's been submitted is um, saying which party is supposed to start by briefing the problem and get the negotiation started when the problem does not necessarily specify who the requesting party is? Oh, it's not specified. Okay, so I, will, I was going to go straight to, you know, usually start the requesting party. Um, you can, I think it's, it's fair to one, um, start, you know, start right away saying again, um, it's not that, it's not that because we have to, um, we want to overthrow you or speak before you, but we feel that you know, trust us by by starting first because there is something really important that, for example, we have to share um, right at the beginning. Or maybe another way would be by asking each other. But really try to. I mean, it's really slippery there because if you try and uh, ask one another so many times, 
and everyone at the beginning wants to be friendly and cooperative and it can well be five minutes so be really mindful that um when you ask each other and the other party says for example well you know it's it's right it's it's right with us you can start start don't go back and say no it's okay with us you can start as well uh, because you don't want to lose time um is there a third way um well yeah you can you can you know it depends on the case it depends how you feel with your strategy but you can also give them the floor and say you know um we we are here to understand so we want to listen to you and that's why I think it's fair to, that you start first. So I would say first, um, no, all those three, all those three scenarios can can be good for you. It it really depends on um, the case. Thank you very much. The next one is what to do when we reach a deadlock, and our yeah. offers are all rejected, and there's no offer from the opposite side too as there are no mediators in this session? Well, I would say there's gotta be a reason. So you, you really have to, you have to understand what the reason is and what's, what is it that's driving this behavior. And again, just, you know, talk because you can, ask because you can. You can say, it, it, we are stuck. We have done one, two, three, four offers. None of them is accepted. You haven't, um, you haven't any offer back. So we, we are kind of, you know, we are lost and we don't understand why, why is it that we are here? Um, if if you you are just here to reject everything, um, should we assume that you're just here to obtain an information? Uh, because we don't want to go there. Because you know, um, it's it's really trying to get on our trust again, and we are here in good faith and we are trying. But honestly, we are not seeing the same uh, from you, and we just wanted to ask you one last time, why is that? Okay, thank you. How will the team be judged in terms of the end result obtained? Is it always pertinent to have a win by the end of the session? Well, I don't know about this specific competition. Honestly, I can't um, tell you. I didn't, since I'm not part of them and I really didn't, check the results i'll be happy to um but usually in all the competitions that i've taken place there's always a winner um so if it's if it's points um uh, when you do the math it, it's always have to be a winner so i i i'm sure there is a criteria here and maybe you can ask the organization committee to send the criteria to you or maybe someone from the competition and someone from the organizing bodies can answer that for you here. Thank you very much. I think this is our last question, unless any other participants have any. Um, so the last one is in case where the other party uses aggressive tactics, where they're like un uncooperative. So do we need to follow pacifying tactics and whether such tactic be beneficial um, in case of time li limited 30 minute sessions. Mm, yeah, that's that's really oh, that's to us. Mm, should we just um, turn the other cheek and you know be uh, pacifiers? Um, I would say it depends. Uh, it depends why is it that the other party is doing that? Is it uh, to scare you away? Is it that they want to take advantage of, you know, unsettling you during the session and get a deal on a on a something that's on better conditions? Um, well, again, I will be vocal about it. I I would say, you know, we feel that 
we don't know if it's tactics. We don't know if it's a strategy. We kind of feel feel pressured and um, we kind of sort of feel an aggression uh, from your side. And this is not we what we want to do here. And it's not going to scare us away. It's not going to make us give you a better deal just so that it, this is um this is finished the only thing that is that it is going to make is you know lose lose time and lose the opportunity to take advantage of this session be it another even five minutes because you can change a lot in five minutes. And I mean, as, again, as integrity, as trust, you can you can show that even in the last five minutes. So again, be vocal about it. And even more so when you don't have as much time, be quick on vocalizing that. If it's not for the other party, at least for the judges, I mean. Thanks, Ina. We've had a few more questions pop through on the chat. Um, so the next one is, does it make a party look weak if they outrightedly acknowledge their faults? No, I don't think so. Um, if, you, if you do that, make sure that, that you say that, you know, um, Again, make sure that you you say that you know it may very well um, give you an impression that this is making us weak or that we are um, admitting to a mistake right away or assuming responsibility right away. Um, it's not because we are weak; it's because we have integrity, and it's because this is the right thing the right thing to do it is to take responsibility for what happened and to try and see how is it that this doesn't happen doesn't happen again how is it that we avoid that in the future and make it even better and learn from that so i, I won't say i wouldn't say it makes you weak unless you make it seem like you accept that just because you think well you know if i don't if I don't assume that responsibility, um, then what am I doing? So it won't make you weak unless you say, you know, I'm doing this because I have integrity and it's because the right thing, it's the right thing to do. Brilliant. The next one is some problems are drama driven too. Just wanted to ask. Like how much drama is acceptable and necessary during the session? <laughs> um, oh, well, it depends. Um, if it's a business, I mean, I would. I was going to jump in and say, you know, um, if it's a family problem, blah blah blah. If it's a business problem, I was going actually to say something that's not right and um, that the emotions are not as high in business problems, and that's not true because. You know, some business are the right, the children of someone, metaphorically speaking. So, you know, um, again, we are embodying a character and we want to be real. And that's really stunning to see when someone is really into character. Just try to not overdo it, I would say. Um, and I guess there will be signals from the other side if you are too um too into the drama um and you can right away say you know i don't want to be dramatic but one two three um this is what is making me act in such a way but i think you have 35 minutes so yeah i don't think you have the time to overdo it <laughs> Maybe. Brilliant. Thank you. The next one is what sort of questions can we expect from the judges? 
what kind of questions from the judges? Um, do you mean in the feedback? I'm not sure because this was a question um, submitted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, yes, sure. Um, well, most often than not, I, I would say I didn't see so many questions from the judges in the feedback session because there is, again, there is a limited time for a judge to share his opinion and his feedback to each and every one of uh, the participants. So maybe maybe you can expect a question if they if they're not sure why you did something and just you know they're trying to check if if you have made it uh, with the right knowledge and with a strategy in mind or was it something that just played out uh, in a very different way and that's why I said you have to admit to mistakes because again, it, it, you by admitting to the mistake, you are saying to the judge that's right there, I, I know I made a mistake, um, but I, I'm just, you know, trying to solve it. Well, I think what maybe the person meant with that one is like, is there going to be a question round with the judges after the simulation? Mm. Well, I had uh, one of the competitions had such a round, I think. Um, it was a self-analysis round. It was right after the session. I'm just remembering. And the, comp the participants got a point for that as well. It was a self-analysis of, uh, of the session that they just had. Um, and we were... You know, asking them how do you, how do you think the session went for you? What you think you did well and what didn't play out as well? Um, but you, again, you have to check if this competition has such a round and if it's giving you a point for analysis. But I think it it was a good thing. It was something that really made an impression for me because uh, I haven't seen that in another competition. Brilliant, thank you. I think this is the last one actually. So the last one, there's this thing about how much the council will be involved during the negotiation. Should the council restrict itself to the part of clarifying things to the client and advise, and advise on offers? Is it so that the client only should answer and decide about the offers? How should the role distribution between the client and the council so it doesn't feel that one is having lesser role than the other during the negotiation? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, I mean, it's really tough. And uh, because again, you have to really know your teammate and in a way have your way of communicating between you two. Um, there's not, you know, a right percentage and every case is different because some of the cases can be very, not, not full of all the law aspects, but still, um, some of them are really giving you that floor. Um, how much? I think you, you really one of one of the things you can do as council right at the beginning is be involved in the agenda. You know, when saying maybe after your first for some um, words sharing what you think happened and why you're here, um, you can structure that for your client and say, you know, um, my client really wants to talk about first, second, and third. Um, so right there, you have your introduction as the person that's making sure the structure of the discussion is followed for your client's needs. And again, for the other party's needs as well. And then maybe I would say answer questions that you can feel that are quite uncomfortable for your client. Um, if it's something that's really business related, again, say, maybe it's not my place to answer that. Justify why you're answering that and it will give some time to your partner to think about um his input or her input and jump right after you and say 
you know, thank you, um, Legal Council. Um, it helped me a lot because it, it, it gave me some insight and what you think on that um, question. Um, I can also add to that and then you, she can or she can share something that's purely business related. But it's hard. I mean, it's really hard to be the council because you have to carve out your place in the session, but you don't have to overshadow your um, your client. And again, you don't have, you don't want to also be silent. So it's it's really hard. Well, thank you very much, Ina. Your extensive you. knowledge in the field, coupled with your practical experience, has brought a very unique perspective to the training session. The ability to communicate complex concepts with clarity and engage the participants throughout the session was truly remarkable. I also just want to say thank you very much to all the participants for joining the session today. I, on behalf of Team Mediate Guru, wish you all the very best for your competition starting tomorrow. Please make sure you all have the resources available with you for the competition, and I hope everyone has a very good day. You too. Um, again, best of luck for tomorrow um in the other days of course i hope um and just my wish for you is really try and do as much of those competitions as you can um it's truly really such a great opportunity to play all those um obtain those com uh, communication skills sorry and meet people you know um really truly like-minded people that we we really need um in this field and I'm, I'm more than happy that competitions are taking place all, all around the world but really thank you for inviting me it was nerve-wracking but good